Okay. There, you can see my opening slide now. Perfect. Awesome, yeah, so uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, it's like a pretty good turnout, so I'm yeah, impressed by the number of people that are, that are joining. So yeah, thanks everyone for, for being here. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna be talking to you today about some of the work that I've been doing over um, kind of the last four or five years uh, in the Fraser River Estuary. Um, so as Emma said, um, I am kind of one of the, the founding members of the, the Still Creek Stream Keepers and I used to live just a few blocks from Still Creek and uh, my interest in, in salmon uh, is, is really uh, because you know it's my, my job um, but also a job that I, I really, really enjoy. So um, I'm, I'm originally from Saskatchewan but uh, I moved to BC when I was about 22. Uh, and then I did my master's at Simon Fraser in the um, Master's of Resource and Environmental Management program. And, and there I started working with uh, Dr. John Moore, um, who, uh, who uh, yeah, is a, is a pretty well-known salmon biologist uh, in British Columbia and in, yeah, in North America and, and how I really got my start. So yeah, I'm gonna be talking to you today about a, a big project that I've been working on for the last five years. Uh, and for the last uh, two years and a bit, uh, it's been part of my uh, PhD that I'm doing at UBC as well, uh, as part of the uh, Pacific Salmon Ecology and Conservation Lab. And yeah, so just uh, to thank some people, uh, Rain Coast Conservation Foundation, I've been working with them for about uh, five years now, and, um, and we've been able to do a lot of amazing things, uh, and it's been a really great uh, job. Uh, and then as well, our funders, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and the Pacific Salmon Foundation, and then our collaborators, uh, UBC, uh, University of Victoria, and uh, the Tawasson First Nation as well. So um, I'm here to talk about salmon today. And uh, as we know, uh, or as most people know, uh, salmon are these amazing species uh, that make these uh, long distance migrations from uh, their spawning grounds in fresh waters, uh, in rivers uh, and streams in North America. Um, they move uh, you know, from these, these freshwater environments uh, through the river out to the uh, ocean, and then they go out to the open ocean and feed, uh, become really, really big, and then eventually they make that journey uh, back, uh, back up into uh, freshwater through rivers um, and then back to their freshwater spawning grounds. But um, as we know, uh, this uh, migration can often be uh, interrupted by the presence of dams. So um, we often uh, hear about the Columbia River and all of its dams, uh, which interrupt uh, uh, you know, the ability of salmon to move uh, through the system and have caused a huge uh, loss of salmon in some areas. So uh, when we think about connectivity in salmon, and we know it's really, really important, um, but as well as dams, there's various other structures which can also interrupt uh, connectivity as well. And so um, that's gonna be uh, kind of what I'm gonna be talking about today. And so when we look at uh, estuaries and coastal floodplains, uh, this is a picture of uh, the lower mainland of Vancouver. Uh, what you can see is uh, you know a lot of a lot of development, uh, but we also have the Lower Fraser River running through here, uh, and you can see the big effect that it has on the marine environment there, where it's coming out uh, into the ocean into the Strait of Georgia. And so estuaries and coastal floodplains are are actually really important habitats for juvenile salmon uh, when they're making that transition from freshwater uh, out to the ocean. Um, and there's several reasons for that, and so. You know that uh, juvenile salmon essentially they all have to move through uh, these habitats uh, to complete uh, that journey to the ocean. So um, this map is a, you know example of different spawning locations in the Fraser River and um, all those different numbered spawning locations. All those fish have to move into the main stem of the river and they have to make it through the estuary uh, to get out to the ocean. So. Uh, we know they don't have a choice to, but to go through there, um, but we also think that it's more important than that. So um, the estuary is an area where you have uh, brackish water, which is this mixed water um, where the fresh water from the river is meeting that salt water from the ocean and it's creating this kind of intermediate uh, mixed, mixed area 
Um, and this is a photo from out in the Strait of Georgia where you can see the Fraser River water uh, hitting the ocean water and creating that kind of mixed water zone. And so uh, when salmon are making their way out to the ocean as juveniles, um, you know, it's, it's really thought that they rely on those uh, mixed water areas uh, to transition to that salt water. So that transition from fresh water to salt water is not an easy one. Uh, and it's thought that that mixed area really helps them make that transition. Along with that, estuaries are often called nursery habitats for juvenile salmon. So uh, this picture in the bottom right here is of a uh, juvenile uh, sockeye salmon in some eelgrass beds uh, in the Skeena River estuary. And uh, it's thought that juvenile salmon go into the estuary and that it's a place where it, there's a, a lot of food, a lot of prey available for, for them but also an area where there's a lot of protection and not a lot of predators. So this a nursery habitat where they're safe, where they can grow uh, as juveniles before they make it uh, further out to the ocean. And then unfortunately, and when we're talking about juvenile salmon use of estuary habitats, uh, in, in North America, we often have to talk about uh, the impacts that humans are having on those areas. So uh, this is a photo from uh, the San Francisco Bay uh, estuary, but it could be uh, essentially from any estuary uh, across the world or across North America where you're seeing, um, you know, these big impacts um, of human activity um, and it's in and estuaries are a really great place for people to settle because there's a lot of marine resources um, and, and other favorable conditions. So uh, unfortunately, they're, they're really highly impacted. So all the work that I do is uh, here in the, in the Lower Mainland, uh, which is in the, the Fraser River watershed. And so uh, the Fraser River is, uh, is this amazing uh, salmon producing river um, that uh, it has been called the greatest salmon producing river worldwide. Um, so it's a huge watershed that takes up uh, over a quarter of British Columbia. It's 233,000 kilometers squared. Uh, so you have this massive watershed with this huge amount of habitat and a huge diversity of habitat as well. So uh, you get a diversity of all five populations of salmon. Um, but when you look at the Fraser River today, especially at the lower Fraser River, uh, you see a lot of human impacts. So we see uh, a lot of different uh, human structures which uh, impact salmon habitats. And then when you look more broadly at uh, how salmon are doing in the Fraser River, um, we see that we have some really significant conservation concerns for uh, Chinook and sockeye, uh, which you hear about uh, quite often in, in the news. Um, so yeah, uh, just to go back to that. So um, talking about the salmon resources that we have in the Fraser River, uh, as I mentioned, we have all five species of uh, Pacific salmon, uh, as well as steelhead. Um, we have, of course, sockeye, which are the ones that are, you know, the most sought after on uh, the dinner table, um, are, uh, are the most abundant species, um, and they're really well spread out through the, through the watershed. So uh, this figure shows the different uh, nursery lakes that uh, that they use throughout the watershed. So you can see they make it you know, all the way, way up to the top of the watershed. That's over a thousand kilometer journey from the ocean. Um, and what you're seeing here as well is, is their nursery lakes. So sockeye, um, they typically spend a whole year in fresh water as juveniles and they spend it in a lake. So they're always kind of spawning associated with uh, one of these lakes. And so uh, that makes it pretty easy for them to be classified uh, in that way. And since they're spending that whole year uh, in a lake before they go out to the ocean, they typically uh, don't really spend a lot of time in the estuary. They kind of just go straight to the ocean. Uh, they've already uh, used the lake as their nursery instead of the estuary, so kind of just going straight through. And then uh, we also have uh, coho that spawn throughout the Fraser River. So you can see um, these, these figures I'm showing are, are the different uh, populations essentially of coho throughout the watershed. So you can see uh, pretty well distributed. Um, but like sockeye, a lot of the, these populations tend to spend uh, more time in, in fresh water uh, as juveniles. So they'll spend a whole year in fresh water as juveniles. And then uh, after uh, a year in, in a stream, then they'll kind of make their way to the ocean uh, as, as a year old. And they typically also don't uh, rear in the estuary for as long. 
Uh, although in other systems, they are really estuary reliant. Sorry, just having a little delay in the slides moving forward. So uh, we also have pink salmon, uh, which are pretty abundant in the Fraser River. So uh, pink salmon are really interesting in that uh, most of this, the salmon that we have coming back from the ocean are coming back as four-year-olds or, or sometimes as five-year-olds. Um, but for pink salmon, they actually have this fixed two-year life cycle uh, where they only go to the ocean for, for a year. And so they come back uh, in their second year of life uh, and, and really in that, really consistently in that manner. So. Uh, in the Fraser River, we have millions of pink salmon which spawn uh, in odd years. And then in even years, we don't really hardly get any. So uh, for juveniles, it's the following year, uh, the even years that you see the juveniles. And they tend to uh, just go straight out, um, straight out to uh, the estuary really quickly as, as really small fry, uh, rear briefly in the estuary uh, as sub yearlings. So that just means uh, when they're less than a year old, uh, and quickly go out to the ocean. So um, pink have kind of uh, abbreviated every part of their life cycle in, in that way. Uh, and then moving on to chum. So chum are, aren't as good as swimmers as uh, coho or uh, chinook or sockeye. So they don't really make it that far up the watershed. So uh, these are the ones that, uh, you know, that we expect to see in Still Creek. Uh, chum is, you know, the, the fish that we're seeing uh, across the, the these small streams in the lower mainland, uh, and that's that's where they're they're really abundant. So they, they stick mostly to the lower Fraser, um, and they they tend to uh, also move kind of like pink um, when they're small juveniles in their first year of life. They move down to the estuary, um, but we see them uh, rearing the estuary for a little longer before moving to the ocean. But uh, yeah, again, they they move out in their first year like pink, uh, unlike sockeye and um, coho. So lastly, uh, I'm going to be talking to you uh, a lot today about Chinook. Uh, Chinook are thought to be the most estuary reliant salmon species in the Fraser River. Uh, we have 15 different conservation units or 15 different populations, uh, which you can see uh, numbered on this map here. Um, and of those, there's, there's two different strategies that Chinook uh, can take. So there's uh, stream type populations, which are a lot like coho. They'll spend a whole year in a freshwater stream, getting big there before moving out in their second year of life. Uh, but we also have two conservation units or, or populations of ocean type Chinook. So um, Chinook that are actually moved to the ocean in their first year of life. And these are the ones that we see spending a lot of time in the estuary. And uh, when we're talking about these, these Chinook in the, in the Fraser River, uh, the two big populations, the two populations we're talking about, uh, this, this number three here, which is the Harrison River down here in the lower Fraser. And then this 13 here is the South Thompson River um, out in the uh, Kamloops, Kamloops uh, Shushwap region. So uh, we have these two uh, populations of, of ocean type Chinook salmon, uh, which are thought to be really reliant on the estuary here in the Fraser River. And unfortunately, when we look at the trends in, in salmon populations in the Fraser River, uh, in Coho, in Chinook, uh, in Sockeye, this in Steelhead, um, we see that they really haven't been doing well lately. And this has been a really uh, a big cause of concern. So um, the, the, uh, the figures here are showing the marine survival. So the percentage of fish going to the ocean that are making it back to spawn. Uh, and you can see for uh, the red is straight of Georgia Chinook. And you can see that the, the marine survival is, is down there at uh, less than half a percent. So uh, less, less than half a percent is really uh, is not going to do it um, in terms of, uh, you know, keeping these populations going. And we've seen really, really poor numbers of Chinook, um, including lately we've seen some really poor numbers in these Harrison uh, ocean type Chinook as well. So uh, they have this uh, escapement target here of, uh, of 80,000 or sorry, 100,000 spawners, uh, and they haven't got uh, anywhere near hitting that target in, in the last uh, six of the last seven years. So, um, yeah, really uh, not doing so great. And when you look across uh, all those different uh, populations of Chinook and the Fraser, uh, you can see that their status is all red. Um, but the two at the bottom here, the green, are these two ocean type Chinook populations. So, these ones that moved to the ocean in their first year. And we're on the estuary, 
uh, with the Harrison having this uh, P there, which means uh, they're not doing as great, but the Cell Thompson uh, with the kind of a no conservation status, so uh, least concern, uh, while all the other ones essentially are, are endangered or threat. And leading to a lot of headlines like this, and, and it's been leading to uh, a lot of a lot of problems for uh, sport fishermen who who rely on 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 you know taking people out uh, as guides as their business to to fish for Chinook salmon. So uh, we've had these really big reductions in the in the Chinook salmon fishery uh, here in British Columbia in the last two years, uh, which has been uh, yeah a, a, a major struggle for for a lot of folks. And when we start to look at why uh, Chinook salmon are maybe not doing so well, uh, we want to start looking at their habitats. So um, when we look at the lower Fraser River, so thinking more about uh, habitat for those uh, ocean type Chinook, these are uh, some uh, not the best drawings, uh, but they, they get their point across. Um, basically showing you that, you know, from uh, what once existed in about 1800, uh, which was basically uh, you know, a salmon production system of, of forest and wetlands, to today we see we have a, really a tiny fraction remaining of the amount of wetlands and forested habitat in the lower Fraser that used to support these salmon. And so um, in a paper that's going to come out pretty soon uh, that a colleague of mine has written, uh, he's shown that it's been about 85% of the, the floodplain habitat has been lost in the lower Fraser. So a huge amount of habitat loss. And then if you move out to the uh, Fraser River estuary, you can see, uh, you know, most of it has been uh, swallowed up by uh, the airport uh, and the city of Richmond and, and, you know, converted for urban development or uh, down here at uh, Westham Island. Uh, we see uh, agricultural developments as well as uh, yeah, down in Tawasson. Um, so we have this, this huge amount of habitat loss in the lower Fraser uh, and the estuary as well as numerous structures in the estuary which interrupt the movement of fish. So if we're wondering why our, our salmon in the Fraser that rely on the estuary aren't doing so great, uh, you know, this, uh, this might be a reason. And if we look back to uh, what the estuary once was, so um, I find these, these charts pretty cool. So this is, this is a chart of essentially what the Fraser River and, you know, the whole lower mainland area looked like uh, before, uh, before colonization. And so uh, this is the airport area here. Uh, you can see there's no, no structures or anything like that. Um, and what's interesting to me, what you can't really see here is that the, the river used to be really shallow. So um, really, really shallow, which was really uh, not very uh, helpful for shipping. So you had uh, a river which meandered over time and, and which was pretty shallow. And uh, when we look down here in the Steveston area, so this is essentially Steveston, it used to have like this kind of meandering channel, uh, which was, yeah, not very deep. Uh, moving to 1860, you can see it's totally moved. So now it's totally different. So, you know, if you're, you're trying to ship through there, it's going to be really inconvenient. So what happened here in 1890, you can see is they started building structures at the mouth of the river. So uh, that got pretty frustrating, not being able to, to ship through the, the main river system. Uh, so they started building structures at the mouth of the river with a few of these wing dams in, well, already in 1890. And then after that, in the, uh, the lower, in, sorry, in the, the main arm, the south arm, uh, as well as in the north arm, in around 1915, uh, they created these major jetties. So uh, here at Gary Point uh, in Steveston, extending essentially, that's about six kilometer long jetty that they built to hold the mouth of the river in place and, uh, and try to keep the water flowing and, and try to keep it, keep it deep um, and yeah, keep that main channel there where, where they could use it. And so when we uh, yeah, skip ahead to today, you can see we still have the Steveston jetty here at the, the mouth of the river, uh, which is an eight kilometer long jetty, uh, which uh, yeah, uh, makes it a strong barrier here. And you can see the way that all of the fresh water and fine sediment is getting pushed out into the middle of the Strait of Georgia, uh, as opposed to just distributing laterally into the estuary. Uh, so it makes you wonder what's happening to these really small juvenile fish that are trying to make it into these estuary habitats, into that mixed area. And along with that, that Steveston jetty there, uh, there's another small jetty on the other side that you can't really see here. If we move to the south, we have the Roberts Bank uh, terminal, Port Terminal Causeway, which is about another five kilometer 
uh, barrier there, as well as the BC Ferries Causeway. And then if you look to the north, if you go to uh, Iona, uh, there's the Iona uh, Sewage Outfall, the uh, North Arm Jetty, and the uh, McDonald's Slough Causeway. So we have these numerous barriers throughout the estuary, uh, which interrupt the movement of, of fish, uh, fresh water, fine sediment, uh, and nutrients. And when you look at like why these barriers exist, I kind of alluded to it already, but you can see what it really does is it gets you from uh, kind of the, uh, the inner estuary to the outer estuary. So the estuary has these expansive five kilometer long sand and mud flats uh, that uh, yeah, are, are really shallow. Uh, they go completely dry every day at low tide. Uh, they're, they're a great place to go for a really neat walk at low tide. Um, but they're, they're really a hassle for shipping. So you can see we've created these numerous barriers here at the north, the, on the main arm, and then down here so that we can get out to an area that's deep enough to actually do some boating in. And so because of that, uh, you can see that essentially what's happened is that, you know, fish are being isolated from the mixed part of the estuary. So they're being forced to go from the river, the freshwater river, to being shot out essentially to the outer estuary, to the, to the salty area and mixing uh, and missing the, the, the mixed area of the estuary. And this is, this is pretty common. So um, this is, uh, yeah, this is not a Fraser estuary only problem. Uh, if, you, uh, if you go to Squamish and take a hike up the Chief, you can see that, uh, you know, estuaries across BC are, are highly impacted. Um, so you can see uh, on the kind of middle of the screen here, this is the Squamish River estuary. You have uh, downtown Squamish has eaten up a, a big part of the estuary. Uh, they have a port here uh, taking up a big piece of the estuary. And then they actually have this spit here. So the whole river is pushed to the, to the north, uh, northwest side and, and fish as well are being forced out of the estuary uh, just like they are in the Fraser. And so uh, because of this being a, a common problem, and, uh, you know, and, and Chinook declines and other salmon declines being uh, top of mind for, for DFO and, and other government officials. Um, what we've actually seen, uh, fortunately, is a lot of investment in this area. So, oh yeah, and there's this bit. And so we, we at Rain Coast, uh, we started working in the estuary in 2016. Um, and we started doing a, just a field research project. We wanted to start to try to understand uh, what was going on in the estuary uh, with juvenile salmon. And so we, we just went out and we started a research project in 2016. And then what we ended up uh, being really fortunate to, to do was we applied to this grant, this Coastal Restoration Fund, uh, which DFO had launched in response to that, uh, to that need that I mentioned. So um, estuaries across BC were, were in need of restoration and and that was thought that, you know, that would help to uh, try to rebuild some of those uh, failing salmon stocks that, uh, that, you know, that everyone relies on. And so uh, we, we were applied to this, this fund. It was 75 million over five years. Uh, since then, there's also been the BC Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund, um, which uh, I think is up upwards of, you know, maybe $180 million now. Um, and yeah, we were really fortunate. We were successful. Um, we got... Uh, yeah, just uh, over uh, two and a half million dollars to start to try to address the the Steveston North Jetty. So yeah, we were we were super happy. Um, we found out about like uh, kind of mid twenty seventeen that that we were getting the funding. And so uh, the, what the idea was was so to put three new breaches into the Steveston Jetty in the first half of the jetty in the area you know where it will provide access to the marsh habitats, to the mixed habitats uh, for those juvenile salmon. So if you're on the, the jetty, this is what it looks like. You can see the river was on one side, you have the marsh habitats and the estuary on the other side, and you have this rock wall uh, in the way separating, <coughs> excuse me, separating any ability for uh, fish to get into those areas. So uh, we figured we'd create a couple of openings uh, without, uh, you know, really making a big impact on the, on the jetty itself. And so, yeah, we were, we were really fortunate. As I said, you know, we got uh, a big, uh, big amount of, of money from the federal government, from DFO. And we went out in 2019 and we created three 
uh, 50 meter wide breaches in the dread in the jetty. And so um, our strategy was to just go out. Uh, we hired uh, yeah this construction company to just make these breaches, just remove the rock material uh, from three 50 meter segments, and then start to allow some natural channel formation to occur over time, uh, and then monitor that formation. So. Uh, in our first round of construction, we just went out and removed material. Uh, we removed uh, about a, a meter and a half of material, which made it so that uh, it was brought down to about a mid-tide level. So uh, the breaches are connected at uh, mid to high tides, but not at low tides. And so that was what we did for phase one, just so we could start to get that process of, of channel formation occurring. And then we, with with the plan to come back for phase two. And so uh, in, in the fall of 2019, we were able to do phase two at the East Breach. Uh, we're looking at doing the other two breaches, uh, one in the, the coming weeks and then uh, the following one next year. And what the, the final construction with phase two is to decrease the, the depth of the breach, um, kind of what you can see here from about a mid tide level down to basically the lowest uh, mean low, low water. So uh, that these breaches will be connected throughout the tidal cycle instead of just that mid to high tide. So, um, so that's what we're, we're continuing to work on. And then as, as part of this, you know, uh, we wanted to address some research questions as well. So um, not only, uh, yeah, this is just kind of taking you back to, to what our, our questions were. So, um, and what the, some data I'm gonna be showing you. So I'm gonna show you what is the timing of migration of juvenile salmon into the Fraser estuary? What is the population origin of those ocean type Chinook that we talked about before uh, across the season? And then what are the habitat preferences uh, of, of different size Chinook in the estuary and across the season? And so these are the, the kind of questions that will form whether our, our, our restoration uh, are questions as well. So. Once we know when juvenile fish are using the estuary, then we're gonna look at, uh, are they also using those breaches at the same time? So our last question is, is do juvenile salmon respond to uh, enhanced connectivity through the construction of breaches uh, in the estuary? So as long, as well as sampling uh, at our breach locations, uh, we have sampling sites across the Fraser estuary that we've been sampling uh, over the past five years, uh, including sites down in the eelgrass around Roberts Bank, uh, sites across the, the sand and mud flats, and then a lot of sites in the uh, inner estuary marsh areas as well. We use uh, techniques like uh, beach staining, purse staining, sorry, and purse staining uh, for, for most of our sampling. And when we're out in the estuary, I'm going to give you a picture uh, of what we're seeing uh, with the different species that I talked about earlier. So uh, this is going to look uh, across from, from March to August. That's when we do our sampling. And this is uh, going to be showing you the length of these fish in millimeters. So the fork length is uh, from the head of the fish to, uh, to its tail, essentially, uh, to, where the, to, it, to where its tail forks. And so this will just give you an idea of what we see in the estuary. So uh, when we go into the estuary, we go out in March uh, and April, and we already see a lot of really small pink and a lot of really small chum that are showing up. You can see, uh, so 40 to 60 millimeters, so four to six centimeters long, these, these really small fish, and, and they only spend a brief period of time in the estuary. They're kind of gone by the end of May, and I'm not really seeing a lot of them past the end of April. So that's, uh, that's what we tend to see, see generally, but uh, we catch uh, quite a few of these, these little guys, uh, but they're not there for very long. And then later in the season, we tend to catch some sockeye. So uh, they're a little bit big, bigger in the six to kind of seven centimeter range. And they tend to show up in uh, about June or July. So giving themselves a, a little bit of a, a break from the competition by showing up a little bit later. But what we're really interested in, uh, of course, was I, what I said was Chinook. So um, as I mentioned, there's, there's stream type Chinook in the Fraser River. And those ones spend a full year in freshwater before they come out. So they're a lot bigger when they're coming out. And they tend to move through the estuary kind of in April and early May. And we don't really tend to see a whole lot of them. Uh, but as I mentioned, you know, these, are, these populations are all doing, doing really poorly. So uh, we might really be underestimating how much they do use the estuary just because of uh, how low uh, in abundance all their populations are. And then looking uh, across the season, 
all of these uh, open circles that you see here, these are the ocean type Chinook that I had mentioned before. So when we're out in the estuary from basically uh, the, the end of March, kind of early April, all the way through into August, we see these small ocean type Chinook. And we see them growing and growing and growing throughout the season. So um, really good evidence uh, that, uh, you know, kind of what I had said before about uh, them being really estuary reliant. We, we really seem to see that in our data. So. Um, well, yeah, that was just kind of you know, what it says in the, the literature. Uh, you know, we've really confirmed it over the last uh, five years to be true uh, here in the Fraser River for these ocean type Chinook. And uh, luckily for us, uh, we get to work with a lot of cool techniques, uh, one of which is uh, being able to do genetics. And so I'm able to just take a, a small uh, a clip from the fin of, of one of these fish uh, and it's uh, non-lethal, um, so just uh, yeah, take a little clip from their fin and send them on their way. Um, and we send those to DFO and we're able to find out where those fish actually came from. And so when we're in the estuary, what we find is a huge number of Chinook coming from the Harrison River. So uh, they tend to come out of the gravel really uh, early as juveniles, um, kind of at the uh, kind of middle of February, end of February. And then we see them showing up in the estuary uh, by March and, and really in huge numbers in April and May. Um, and then they, they kind of taper off uh, around uh, the, the beginning of June. And then we see the ocean type Chinook from the South Thompson show up. So this different group of, of Chinook from the South Thompson uh, showing up later in the season. Uh, and they really kind of replace the Harrison Chinook and they're the ones uh, that we find in the estuary in July and August. So uh, we see these two different groups of of Chinook, these two that are the ones that are kind of doing a lot better than the stream type ones. Uh, they're both relying on the estuary, but they're doing it in a different way. So the South Thompson ones are coming out uh, a, lot, a lot later in the season uh, when, the, you know, there's, there's less competition once the Harrison ones are moving on. And what we see when we look at uh, the size of those fish over time, the ones that we identify as Harrison Chinook, we see they seem to be growing and growing uh, throughout the season. So a good idea, a good uh, indication that they're sitting in the estuary uh, and using it as that uh, nursery habitat that I mentioned before. So back to uh, the restoration project. So um, I, I love Google Earth. Uh, I wish they would take more photos uh, over my breaches, uh, but uh, they take quite a few. And what, what we tend to see or sorry, what, uh, what you can see here is, yeah, our three breaches in the Steveson Jetty. And as I mentioned, we essentially, the middle breach is, uh, is essentially what it looked like right after construction. So we just created a, a kind of a rectangular breach in the jetty uh, and then hope for natural channel formation to occur over time. So what you can see here is at the middle breach, we're not really seeing a whole lot of that. There's a pretty solid wall of marsh. Uh, there wasn't really any large openings in it or anything like that. Um, so we're not seeing a lot of channel development there, but if you look to the east breach, you can see uh, we have this little channel that's kind of developing this way, and then when you look to the west breach, you can see we've got a pretty strong channel developing through there. So we have uh, these three different breaches uh, with these three channels uh, in various forms of development, kind of one that's not really developing, a small one, and then one uh, that's, that's developed a lot more. And so, uh, yeah, just so you can see it's, it's, you know, it's 50 meters wide at the breach, but the channels are uh, a lot less wide than that. And so one of the main things that we really wanted to know with our restoration is, you know, our fish using it. Um, and so what we do is uh, we use a net that we call a fike net, uh, which is basically just a two wings that filter back towards uh, a trap in the middle, um, as you can see here. And so this was in 2019, after we had just made the openings and there wasn't really much channel formation. Uh, you can see, you know, this guy's standing ankle deep water. Uh, it's not very deep. Um, and there's a small channel flowing through here. This is at the east breach. And then here, this is at the west breach. So uh, at the west breach, you can see a bit nicer of a channel flowing through back to here. And then in 2020, after a year of just the river flowing and, and moving sediment along with it, uh, you can see now this is here down at the east breach and here this is at the west breach so considerable channel development over time and yeah differences in the you know in the way that the net is stretched across the the channel of course um which uh, also yeah going to lead to uh, different numbers of fish that were caught 
And when you look at the uh, middle breach here, you can see there's like a really small channel that we were able to put a really small net in for a few uh, sampling rounds as well. And so the, the results of uh, our sampling at the breaches, in 2019, we captured uh, 554 salmon moving through our breaches. Uh, they're mostly chum, so we had about 300 chum and then uh, about 150 Chinook, and then we managed to catch two sockeye as well. So uh, those are fish uh, we captured mostly early in the season. And then we went back in 2020. Uh, we were able to continue our sampling this year, uh, you know, respecting COVID protocols, we're outside, we're able to keep our distance, uh, kind of as you can see from the photos, our, 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 our sampling is passive. We just set the net across the channel and then just let it fish. So. Uh, we were able to continue our sampling this year and we caught almost 1,500 uh, salmon moving through our, our breaches, almost 300 Chinook. Uh, we caught 174 sockeye, so we were seeing sockeye smolts moving through. Uh, we caught 420 pink as this was a, a juvenile pink out migration year, which you know last year was not. Uh, we actually captured uh, over 20 coho moving through the breaches, which we didn't catch any last year, um, you know, and, and over 550 chum. So, uh, increasing uh, our numbers across the board uh, of, of the number of fish that we captured uh, moving directly through our breaches. So, uh, you know, we're really happy to see that, um, you know, we're only sampling the breaches for a fraction of the time that they're connected throughout this migration period. So um, I haven't done the, the back of the envelope calculation, but uh, it's a lot of fish moving through those breaches potentially. And then uh, just giving you a look at, um, so we, we set our net uh, and it just it just sets across the breaches. Uh, we we measure how long we've set it for, and and then we we compare that to the number of fish we catch. And you can see um, if you look at our data from 2019, uh, our best day was we captured just over 30 chinook per hour. Um, so that doesn't mean that we always set the net for exactly an hour. It's just uh, you know if we set it for half an hour and we catch 15, that's that's 30 an hour. Um, and so that was our best day in in 2019. And you can see we, we only caught Chinook on six days in, in 2019 at the breaches. Uh, but moving forward into 2020, uh, you can see now I think we caught Chinook on about 20 different days uh, moving through the breaches. We had uh, several, we had two days where we had over 50 an hour, uh, you know, another four days where we had over 30 an hour. So really saw an increase uh, in that rate of passage during that, that peak season early in, in April and May. And then we also managed to capture some in, in June, July, and August. So uh, still managing to, to capture a few fish uh, uh, later on into the season. If we look at uh, the chum catches, you can see it was the same. We, we had six days where we, we or sorry, what, five days here where we captured chum. And then once it moved into uh, later into May, June, July, we didn't see any. Uh, in 2019, uh, and a peak of about you know 70 per hour. Uh, in, in 2020, we had a day where our catch per unit effort was almost 250 chum per hour, and we had a couple other really high days. Uh, but it continued to follow that pattern that I showed you in our earlier data, where uh, chum are in the estuary early, uh, but then they tend to to leave pretty quickly. So uh, moving into May and June, not really seeing so many. If we look at the other species that we captured in 2020 but didn't see in, in 2019, uh, we had one day where we had almost a catch per unit effort of 500 juvenile pink and a couple other days over 50. Uh, but as I showed you again from the other data, you know, the pink comes through quickly and then they're gone. Uh, we also had a couple of good days uh, where we caught quite a few sockeye and a couple of days where, where we caught some coho as well. Um, and yeah, to your question, Alan, that I just saw in the chat there, uh, some of them did come back as uh, hatch, or some of them were fin clipped coho, um, but I haven't got the results back on, on where, which hatchery they've come from yet. And if we look at the size of those fish that are moving through the breaches, so um, if you just look at the photos here on the bottom, so you can see this is an ocean type Chinook here on one side and this much bigger one, that's a stream type. So that's one that's a year older. And what, what we saw in 2020 was that we actually captured some of these larger stream type Chinook uh, moving through our breaches. And then throughout the season, we still captured some uh, fish moving through the breaches later in the season, including uh, a South Thompson uh, Chinook moving through the breach uh, in August uh, there as well. So um, we, we're really happy to see that increased number of Chinook 
uh, that group of uh, stream type Chinook on a couple of different sampling locations or occasions, and then some fish later in the season. Yeah, just emphasizing my point. And then if you look at the, the sizes of the other fish that we captured, you can see the, the chum are just kind of moving through. Uh, they're, they're mostly really small fish, uh, mostly in April. If we look at the pink that we captured, uh, this is a picture of them. You can see this is millimeters here. Like these are, these are, you know, three and a half centimeter long fish. And we're just seeing them moving through at that really small size. And then if you look at the sockeye we captured, so this is a, this is a sockeye smolt on the bottom here. So you can see we captured this big group of sockeye smolts uh, in late April and some in May as well. Um, so two years ago in 2018 was a big sockeye spawning year. Uh, so this would be, this was the year that they were coming out and yeah, we saw quite a few of these smolts in the estuary, which was uh, good to see considering sockeye returns were really poor this year. Uh, so yeah, just to summarize, uh, in 2019, we just saw a small chum and, and small Chinook moving through our breaches at the start of the season. Uh, but moving into 2020, once the breaches uh, have, have created much larger channels, they're moving a lot more water through. Uh, we're seeing all five species of salmon, uh, both ocean type and stream type Chinook. And then probably related to spawner abundance, we saw a large burst of pink and sockeye, uh, which was yeah, really cool to see. And then we also managed to catch Chinook moving through the breaches uh, every month from March through August, which was uh, really neat to see. And uh, if you look on the bottom here, the photos, so this is the east breach at low tide uh, near the, uh, the end of construction. This is uh, four kids uh, in there that were checking it out. And then uh, in the viewer here, and I think we have four different species of, of juvenile salmon as well. And so uh, just to kind of wrap up, so what are we doing next? We're, we're finishing, uh, phase two construction at two of our breach sites. So uh, we're doing the west breach in a few weeks here and then the middle one uh, next year. And then we're waiting for channel development to continue to occur uh, over, over time and, and create channels on Sturgeon Bank. And so uh, hopefully we'll be able to continue to get funding to keep our, our monitoring going. Uh, it will be doing monitoring next year and yeah, hopefully beyond. And then we're also looking at some more projects. So uh, we're hopefully gonna be getting some uh, funding uh, to start addressing the, the North Arm Jetty. So you can see this is the North Arm Jetty. This is the Iona uh, Sewage Treatment Facility. And uh, we're hopefully going to be uh, looking at putting three breaches in that jetty. We've applied for some money uh, from a few different funds. Uh, hopefully going to be doing that over the next uh, three or four years. And uh, yeah, so with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Uh, feel free to uh, email me. Um, check out uh, yeah, Raincoast uh, online, uh, uh, raincoast.org, or uh, I think that's our Instagram at Raincoast Conservation. And yeah, happy to take any more questions. Yeah, I feel like, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, so yeah, I think I answered Alan's question. Um, so the breaches are sort of accessible <laughs> to the general public. They're not really, but if you walk out from Steveston at like a really low tide, you can walk across. There's just one channel that kind of cuts across Sturgeon Bank. So if you walk across at uh, the appropriate low tide, you can make it out there, um, but it's got to be at a really low tide. But if you have a boat, you can get there. Um, so if you mean at the breaches, uh, like we, so, you know, we're, we're just comparing our, our, you know, catch per unit effort uh, at the breaches this year as opposed to last year. Um, so we're out there quite a, quite a bit doing our, our sampling. Um, but one of the things, you know, that we always have to look at in the estuary is, is, you know, how many spawners are there? Um, so we also have, uh, yeah, I guess not for the breaches, we, we can't really have reference sites, but uh, yeah, of course the, the number of fish moving through the breaches is always gonna be related to um, how many spawners there were the year before. Um, so, you know, just because we saw an increase from one year to the next in the estuary might not mean it's because of our restoration. It just might 
you know, there were more spawners. Um, but we try to, you know, have reference sites and do other things to, to account for that. Uh, to Jennifer's question, how many days in each month did you have people counting? So uh, we're out there pretty much all, all spring and summer, uh, basically like five days a week. Um, we do uh, sampling at, at a variety of sites though. So uh, we usually go to our sites at least once every two weeks. Uh, and that allows us to kind of catch the kind of the ups and downs of, of the numbers of fish in the estuary. Um, so to uh, Braden Foster's question, what estuary habitat do the salmon prefer? Uh, so yeah, we sample uh, yeah, across uh, the, the sand and mud flats, uh, the marsh and, and the eelgrass, and we really catch the vast majority of our, our juvenile salmon in the marsh habitats in the inner estuary. Um, the, we, the, uh, the sand and mud flats are a huge open area. And when we do our Persane sets out there, we'll generally catch a few Chinook uh, or like the odd school of uh, other salmon, but we generally don't tend to catch that much. Uh, we, we catch a lot of fish in the eelgrass down at Roberts Bank, down in Tawasin, around the Tawasin Ferry Terminal and, and the Roberts Bank Causeway. Uh, but we don't tend to catch a whole lot of juvenile salmon down there. Uh, but we're curious if that's not just because of the, the Roberts Bank Causeway itself, kind of deflecting them out into uh, deeper, saltier water, and they might not just find their way there. But it definitely seems that uh, from what we see, especially the kind of Harrison Ocean type Chinook, kind of tend to, tend to stay in the marsh until they're at least about six or seven centimeters, and then they'll venture further out. But we catch the vast majority in that area. Um, yeah, Alan, happy to share the presentation. Um, how do we determine the 50 meter width of the breaches? Um, so we just kind of went with 50 meters uh, because it was something that we could uh, accomplish kind of construction wise. Uh, we figured it would give us a, a good amount of flow going through. Um, we, we did some, uh, we, we hired a consultant to do some hydraulic modeling work to look at, um, you know, if we made breaches of that size, uh, what would the impact be over time as far as uh, developing channels and, and also impacts uh, on uh, the main uh, river. So looking at, you know, making sure there's no impacts to uh, navigation as well. Uh, so 50 was kind of like a, a good size that we could accomplish that we thought that there would be, um, you know, a good amount of, of flow moving through. Um, because not only do we want to promote the flow of, of, of fish, but we're also hoping that uh, we're increasing the kind of natural uh, distribution of fresh water and fine sediment and, and the kind of uh, natural processes that build a, a healthy estuary to begin with. And so, um, yeah, that was kind of, uh, we figured that as big as we could go safely. Um, for inland dams, like, um, I mean, like really it's, it's, it's like fish ladders so that adult fish can get up and then some way for the juvenile fish to get out. And so um, like at, at Alouette Lake, they're, you know, they wanna put in a fish ladder uh, so that fish can get up. And then what they do is they spill water over the dam spillway to let the juveniles out in the spring. So one way is you could just spill water over top of the dam to let the fish out. Uh, have I been involved in any eelgrass restoration? I haven't. Uh, I know other folks that, that have been uh, some other uh, groups that do eelgrass restoration, but um, we, yeah, we haven't. This is this is kind of the, the start of Raincoast doing any restoration. We had really mostly been into uh, mostly doing science and advocacy before this. This is kind of our first big restoration project. Are we monitoring their upstream traffic? Um, do you mean like uh, just upstream movement of, of fish or? We, yeah, we, we, have, we have various sampling sites. We mostly focus on the estuary, um, but we've been sampling up as far as, uh, what is this? I guess the bottom of Anasis Island um, this, this past year, but we're, we're mostly focused down in the estuary. But uh, yeah, I kind of wanted to show that other data just to give you an idea of, you know, what we see for salmon in other parts of the estuary. Um, so that, you know, if we weren't seeing fish moving through the breaches in the same way we see them using the rest of the estuary, I think that would be kind of a concern. Uh, 
Yeah, and thanks for you know, all the people uh, in the chat asking questions and everything. Yeah, so for yeah, Carmen's question, like basically we we had to get an authorization uh, from Transport Canada and to, to be able to make these breaches. And the Port of Vancouver had various concerns about us. Um, if, yeah, various concerns about us impacting navigation in the main channel because, of course, they have uh, you know a huge amount of, of shipping traffic going through there. I think this size of the breach is is pretty good at 50 meters. Like there's like a lot of flow going through. It's becoming very difficult for us to set our nets and even catch fish moving through the breaches. Um, and 50 meters is nice where you're not going to you're not going to have a big current. And so yeah, the one thing they were concerned about was whether it would create like a a cross current in the main channel that would pull ships like into the breaches, uh, which we're not seeing right now. And so I think we'll, we'll kind of just keep them at the level that they're at. Um, and I think with the three that we've made, like I'm happy with that in the Steveston jetty. And that's why we're now looking to make uh, three in the North Arm jetty and then kind of go from there. And I think after that, I'll go for probably more like bigger habitat projects, I think is what's needed. Uh, in the lower Fraser and kind of making a greenway of, of habitat along the river. Um, to John's thing about salt, uh, I'm not sure about that. We were just kind of talking about the impacts, uh, potential impacts. Um, question about tying information to climate change in terms of water temperature changes. Uh, what are additional factors or variables? Now, uh, as like Additional factors on top of climate change in terms of like warming the main stem river. Uh, well, forestry would definitely be the main one. Um, any loss of, of shading uh, is going to increase water temperatures. So uh, if we want to try to decrease the, yeah, the water temperature in the main stem, as much shade and riparian in the upper river as possible is probably the, the way to go. And that's probably a lot of what, you know, those stream type Chinook, a lot of those stream type Chinook spawn like way up in the upper watershed um, and they need to spend a whole year in fresh water. And so uh, they battle, you know, forestry impacts on the watershed as well as agriculture, pulling water out of the rivers. There's, you know, some of these areas where these Chinook spawn, uh, the amount of water licenses that uh, are for agriculture are, you know, pulling so much of the water out of these, uh, rivers and streams that there's hardly any left for the fish. And then when things get really warm in August, uh, there's not enough rib, not enough water and it heats up really fast. So that's another factor. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. If there are no other questions, we'll we'll start to wrap it up. Give you a couple seconds to jump in if you have any others. You can unmute yourself if that's easier. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dave. Um, that was so informative. Um, yeah, and there was there's lots of people saying thank you in the chat. So um, yeah, I think we've all learned a lot and have a lot to think about. Yeah, great work. Thank you for your presentation from Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Glad to see so many people uh, tuned in. Yeah, thanks so much, Dave. That was amazing. We were yeah, I no turned my camera off because we were all quietly eating dinner listening to you. <laughs> we're eating dinner already. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> great. It's this Zoom is really great because you get to meet, drink beer while you're having such a meeting. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> is that license? <laughs> awesome. Uh, For Marcus's question. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm at UBC. I'm in the Faculty of Forestry. Uh, but that was just kind of but my supervisor, Scott Hinch, uh, he's in the Faculty of Forestry, so that's why I, I 
I kind of ended up, ended up with him, but he's a, he's a big salmon guy. So they have uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Program in forestry uh, is, is, is really popular. It seems like it's pretty good. Um, one of the components is like a, a, I'm not sure it's a whole semester, but there's like a field school. Um, so that, that seems pretty good. Um, I did my undergrad back in Saskatchewan just in biology, uh, but I did the master's in, in yeah, resource management program at SFU. That was really good. Um, and Jennifer is asking about a work party on Saturday, November 14th in the morning, um, where we've been doing some monitoring uh, at Still Creek uh, spawner surveys, but we're still figuring it out. <laughs> still figuring out if, we're, if we are allowed, um, but hopefully we can do it. I, I'd like to, we're outside, we'll stay distant, but um, I'll keep everyone updated on that. Well, sounds good. Hopefully some more fish will come further up. I found like literally two that were like, looked like they were spawning, like there was a pair and they had one little spot. And they were like the only, like the only two fish, but they were spawning. They were trying. And then Carmen, I don't know. Have you met Fernando at all? He went there today to try to get photos, but he only found a dead one. He does the urban, urban salmon stuff. He does. He's a photographer and filmer. <laughs> Yeah, I got the picture last on Sunday of, of Jeremy holding the fish, but I, I didn't go back down today. I was going to go again tomorrow and take, take a look and see if I could find more. There were five for people who were still on the call. There were five. Dave found five salmon. Yeah, well, four plus a head. Oh. <laughs> still five. Oh, it is, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Uh, my name's Andrew Egan, or Drew Egan, and I work at Langara College. And I've been in touch with uh, Emma about um, trying to get my students. I'm the environmental studies coordinator. It's unrelated to your Fraser River, but it is related to Still Creek. And um, we usually go and monitor other locations with my students, um, like in Tofino and Pacific Rim. However, because of COVID, we can't do that. So I'm looking for a stream, a habitat here uh, in the lower mainland. So I've got a proposal written um, that I'm gonna send and look for uh, help with. Uh, I, earlier you were talking about things like salinity um, and, and measuring that. And that's one of the parameters we'd like to test for water quality, the water quality in Still Creek for. Is there any others? Like the proposal basically looks at six months of weekly water samples, uh, water quality, and then a mapping of the inputs. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends like what you're interested in. So like um, Alan is the one who's been doing a lot of work on, on like the yeah, salt coming in from road salt and and that's really flashy so like anytime that I've gone to Still Creek and, and um, you know we used our, our YSI our water chemistry meter the salinity is like zero basically um, but you know the other things that are potentially interesting uh, that are easy to measure is you know like dissolved oxygen and temperature uh, temperature would be mostly just interesting kind of in the lower reaches in, you know, July, August, kind of low flow, um, yeah. later summer is, is when you might see high temperatures and low dissolved oxygen, yeah. Uh, yeah. which are, you know, those would be the things to really look out for. Um, and, you know, kind of the upper reaches of Still Creek, uh, like when it first comes out of the pipe, uh, the DO is, is like a little bit low, but it's kind of fine. And then it usually seems fine most of the way down. Um, it would be interesting to look at just kind of the, the variability in flow because it's so flashy because there's so much pavement, um, which is not great for the creek, obviously. Um, but, and then if you want to get into, you know, other things like if, if you're talking about water quality, doing any kind of like contaminants work, it gets like really expensive really quickly. Um, That's what I think. 
could do nutrients is easier, like looking for like nitrogen, um, potassium. Yeah. We have uh, we we have got ammonia. We'll do ammonia and uh, nitrate. Yeah, Your, potassium as well. I can look. Or at no, that. I guess I was thinking uh, like I'm phosphate. Sorry. Yeah, I, uh, mo some of the reports talk about detergent as being a bit of an issue. Um, yeah, and then hydrocarbons as well are, get really expensive. Yeah, those are yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, doing like, you know, a lot of the contaminant work uh, is so expensive that it's just yeah impossible. Well, that's the thing. It's got to go through ALS. But hypothetically, you could do like, I guess you could look at, um, if you could get it into soil, a clean soil, you might be able to measure the hydrocarbon in the clean soil because you can test the hydrocarbons in soils fairly easily and under low cost, so... Yeah, and I mean, that's probably where you'd find it anyway, too, right? As yeah. opposed to really in the water. Okay. All right. So, yeah, that's just my, my questions in and around, you know, trying to trying to get, find a, a suitable project for my students to do for, yeah. for a period of time. So. Hey, Drew, well, send, send me an email at acjames76 at gmail.com because we're working on a project for getting monitored uh, information from various streams in the Lower Mainland. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I, I need to find people that can use the the data as well. So, can you can you type that email address in into the chat? I did. Yes. Oh, you did. Okay. Perfect. All right. Yeah. I'll I'll get it off of there. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. That's a big relief. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, awesome. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone for coming out. Thanks again, Dave, for speaking. That was really awesome. Um, and thanks everyone for such a lively chat conversation as well. It was very worthwhile. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, yeah. Thanks everybody. Okay, I'm gonna just download this chat file and uh... all right, I'm gonna close the meeting. Thank you everyone so much. Okay.